Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I'm Mukhtar Rabban from the Humanizing Pedagogy Project at Nelson Mandela University. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome all to our sixth webinar in the Exploring a Humanizing Pedagogy series. We are honored and elated today to welcome our presenter, synonymous with research in the humanizing pedagogy, Professor Carol Rogers from the United States. We also welcome Dr. Heloise Satora, a head of department in the Faculty of Education at Nelson Mandela University. Dr. Satora will serve as the respondent in today's webinar. Welcome to all our attendees on Zoom and Facebook, colleagues, staff and students from Nelson Mandela University and colleagues and researchers joining us from many other universities as well. On behalf of the HP Project, the Learning and Teaching Co-Lab and the Faculty of Education, at Nelson Mandela University. We are grateful that you made the time to join us today. Just to repeat the house rules for those joining us for the first time, uh, in the Zoom room, the mics have been muted for the duration of the presentation and response. Please feel free to post questions and comments in the chat while the presenter and respondent are speaking. Facebook viewers may post comments and questions on the live stream to participate in today's webinar. There will be a Q&A session towards the end of the webinar and all questions will be posed then. At that stage, should you wish to speak, you may raise your hand, enable your video, or request the mic in the chat and I'll send you a request to unmute. You may also send your questions directly to me by selecting my name from the drop-down menu in the Zoom room. We are looking forward to an engaging session this afternoon. On that note, we are deeply honored to welcome Professor Carol Rogers. Carol Rogers is an Associate Professor of Education at the University at Albany State University of New York, the United States. Her research focuses on reflective practice, presence in teaching, the philosophy of John Dewey, the history of progressive teacher education, and the theory and practice of a humanizing pedagogy. In 2011, she was a Fulbright Scholar at Nelson Mandela University in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. She was also a Peace Corps volunteer in Senegal in the late 1970s. She worked for two years in Southeast Asian refugee camps in the early 1980s and for nearly 20 years at the School for International Training in Brattleboro, Vermont. Her work is influenced by John Dewey, Caleb Gattino, Maxine Green, Paolo Freire, and her ongoing work with teachers and children. She's currently consulting and researching the use of descriptive inquiry processes in a K-5 public charter school in the Bronx. In March of 2020, she published The Art of Reflective Teaching, Practicing Presence with Teachers College Press. Professor Rogers, once again, welcome back. Another warm Mandela University welcome. Thank you, Mukhtar, and thank you for this invitation. I am deeply honored to be back with old friends and, and new friends um, as Mukhtar said, in 2011, I was uh, a Fulbright Scholar working with the Faculty of Education when Denise was the Dean. Um, and it was one of the most significant years of my life. It was <clears throat> uh, life transformative for me. And I continue to draw on the learning that, um, that I experienced during that year. And I can only hope to offer a fraction of what you offered me during that year today. Um, before starting, I just wanted to um, acknowledge the this, this situation, <laughs> the world situation that we're all in, um, the huge amount of stress I think that everybody is under. Uh, I had a meeting with students yesterday, a community meeting, and they're all feeling it. Schools are changing from day to day. They don't know what sort of format they'll be using. Um, we in the United States are recovering from post-traumatic Donald Trump syndrome. And even as that um, dispensation seems to have been conquered, we, we fight the, um, the knowledge that there are many white supremacist groups that are forming and organizing across the country. And that is a, another huge um, area of stress, not to mention the, the pandemic and, and the isolation that comes with it. So I just wanted to acknowledge that 
we in the United States are feeling that, you in South Africa are feeling that, people around the world are feeling that. Um, we all have that in common, um, but it's taking its toll. And I, I realize that and offer compassion to everybody who's here and to everybody who's not. Um, so today I wanted to, I will um, share my screen now. Let me just not look at myself. Okay. Okay, so I, I'm going to talk about um, one course that I teach. Uh, it's an online course um, called Understanding, Learning, and Teaching. It's fully online. It's fully asynchronous, except for five one-hour meetings on Zoom uh, during the semester. Um, the focus of the course is learning how to see. I work with teachers who are already practicing in schools. They're K through university teachers. Some of them are trainers um, rather than teachers per se in schools. So I have a, it's a big variety of, of students that take this course. Um, I take the position, as you'll see in this presentation, that lived experience is at the heart of learning. And that story is a way of making meaning of experience. And that immersing students in experiences and then giving them the opportunity to story those experiences is an act of humanizing. Um, so here we go. Oops. So I want to start by defining my terms. Um, I take the definition of a humanizing pedagogy directly from uh, your website. I think there are various de definitions out there, but they all more or less say the similar things. That is teaching practices that intentionally utilize the histories, knowledges, and realities of students as an integral part of educational practice and cast students as critically engaged active participants in the co-construction of knowledge. And I would add to that um, the purpose of extending and deepening our humanness in the service of a just and humanized society. And I draw on both John Dewey for that definition and uh, Pat Carini. Um, my definition of experience, I take directly from Dewey that it is the interaction between a person and the world. And this world, um, very broadly conceived, consists of other people, creatures, the natural and human made world, as well as the forces of context that are, you can't put your hands on, but are certainly felt um, that exert power over the shape of all of these interactions. And I think of story um, as the constant construction and reconstruction of our experience. Um, and I think of those words, construction and reconstruction, which are also Dewey's words, as basically the definition of, of reflection. Um, they give those experience coherence and meaning. So I wanna just take a second to look at the, the um, illustration because, and this will be familiar to those of you with whom I worked back in 2011. Um, it's the I, thou, and it, um, or the teacher, student, and content. Um, and these interactions exist in every classroom all the time. In addition to that, you've got the forces of context that are impinging and shaping what happens between each of those nodes of the triangle. Um, I see learning as happening between the students or what I call the thou and the content, which I call the it, that these lines here are lines of learning. And the job of the teacher is to, is to, is to observe the interactions between these two and to set up the situations um, that allow students, well, excuse me, that allow students to interact um, with the content. The, 
this interaction here is relational. It's that relationship between the student and the teacher, but it needs, in, in a classroom situation, it needs the it, it needs the content, content. And I'll just add one more thing that the content itself, um, what David Hawkins calls the it, is extracted from the world. That all of the content that we teach students is sort of artificially packaged as an excerpt from the world itself. Um, so the subject of biology is really taking that piece of the world and putting it into um, uh, a content area, but it's the world itself really that's being learned. Okay. So the course uh, that I teach, ETEP 621, called Understanding, Learning and Teaching, is a master's level course for practicing teachers that focuses on what it means to see and make sense out of or reflect on classroom life broadly defined in the contexts of schools, institutions, towns, and countries in which students and teachers work and the social, political, and cultural forces, forces that shape them. Um, and I wanna just go back up to these words, what it means to see. Um, this is really what I've devoted my professional um, life to, is figuring out um, how teachers learn to see in the classroom, to see their students, to see all those aspects of, the, of that triangle that I just described. All of the complexities, all of the, the unpredictabilities, to see all of that, which is of course impossible, but that's the goal is to see so that you can offer students the best next step in their learning. Um, I watched the uh, presentation of Sarah Black, um, whom you heard, I think earlier this week. Um, and I, as I understand what she was saying, the notion of proximity is what I mean by to see, or I would call it being present. Um, with all of what's going on, including oneself. So the guiding um, pedagogical principles for this course are the following. Uh, first, that all learning begins with experience and all experience is embedded in multiple contexts. Secondly, that students come with funds of knowledge, Louis Malle's um, uh, concept of funds of knowledge uh, to draw upon. And another way of thinking about funds of knowledge is experiences. Our students come with, with a lifetime um, of experiences up to that, uh, that point in their life, a lifetime of experiences, which are really funds. They are there for us to draw on um, and we need to draw upon them. Um, that reflection on experience allows for meaning making and for meaningful work. Um, that we can go through life I think of it um, metaphorically as a basket of colorful pieces of material, each one representing an experience. And we can have a beautiful collection of experiences, but it isn't until we begin to sew, sew them together that um, we can bring coherence and meaning to those experiences. A fourth principle is that being present through frequent individual and group communication and integrative lectures in this course nurtures trust, relationship, and investment, both from the students and from me. And finally, and this um, bumps up against the last presenter a little bit, that community and remote learning is possible. So the course itself, um, what I call the container for the course, the structure of the course is divided into seven two week modules. And each module follows the same sequence, six step sequence, starting with um, a focusing experience, which is often a poem or a song or a piece of music, just something to, to um, ground the energy of the people who begin the module. The second step is what I call a grounding experience. And I'm 
going to be talking about these grounding experiences in a minute, which set up the theme of each module and relate to the course text, the readings that I have, uh, as well as the podcasts and films. Um, the third step is students do their work. They do the readings, they listen to the podcast, they watch the films. And as they're doing so, they're, they're hopefully connecting the experience that I've just asked them to go through to what they're reading and listening to. The fourth step is to reflect on their experiences and the text. And they do that through small group discussions. Um, I don't know what platform you all use in South Africa. We at my university use Blackboard, which is not the most friendly, user-friendly platform in the world, but it works. Um, so they have text-based discussions, but also once during the each module, I meet with them for an hour on Zoom so they can um, do some live interacting with each other and with me. And these posts, I will read almost all of them when they sort of, um, uh, dissipate into small talk, I, I stop reading, but um, the, the first two or three posts for each person I, I will read um, and occasionally enter in and give my opinion, but I don't feel any obligation to respond to every single post. That would be impossible and exhausting and not terribly useful. The fifth um, element uh, in the sequence is my integrative lecture. And again, I'm going to talk about this in more detail. Um, and the lecture consists of my reflections on what students have posted and said in the Zoom session um, and their words. So I integrate both my lecture and their words together into, well, my lecture consists of my words and their words integrated together. Um, and then they have to respond to that lecture, which is in written form. Um, and then I respond to each of their responses. And then finally, at the end of each module, I gather uh, descriptive feedback from students. I want to know how um, the module was for them, what worked, what got in the way. Uh, I want to know what learning they're taking away. Um, and then I respond to each of those bits of feedback as well. And then there's an ongoing project. Um, each student uh, throughout the semester um, observes a child um, or a, a learner in their context um, from five different angles, um, disposition and temperament, physical appearance and gesture, connection to others, modes of thinking and learning, and strong interests and preferences. And they, they fill out these categories over the course of the semester um, and then hand in a final descriptive review at the end. They also write two, two response papers and a final paper. So that's the, the basic structure of the course. So now I wanna take you through um, the grounding experiences that I offer um, in each module. So, the, the purpose of the course, as I've said, is to learn to see. And I, I start with um, what I think of as, as simple, <laughs> simple exercises, and then bring them to more and more complex um, uh, tasks of seeing. So we start with a learning story. Um, and in fact, this is where I started with my work with you all back in 2011 when we gathered humanizing learning stories. And it's essentially the same task. I asked students to write about a time when they learned something, but really learned something, something that stayed with them, something that made them feel um, expanded, more expansive, more powerful, more capable, um, more powerful to act in the world in a word that humanized them. Um, and as I said, they can write about um, anything of, in any learning experience in their life, in school or out of school. Almost never do students write about in school learning stories. Sometimes they do. But um, thinking back to Nokanya's 
a comment or question, uh, I think to AJ Franklin about, you know, how do we bring the grandmother in? Um, these learning stories often contain grandmothers. They also, you know, I have father and son learning stories and, you know, I, I have these images in my mind, one father and son who climbed Mount Denali together. Um, another uh, immigrant woman from um, uh, Nigeria, I think, or it might have been Ghana, who, who learned to cook yolof rice from her grandmother. But she wrote about her grandmother being having died and having to um, remember how to cook rice, following a recipe and then realizing that the way to cook that rice was to remember her grandmother's love. So, so I get, you know, these amazing, wonderful stories from students. They read each other's stories. They get to know each other through these stories. And the, the person comes into the room right from the very first module. Uh, the second exercise is drawing a leaf and the, um, this, cover leaf is, is one of the leaves that one of my students drew several years ago. Um, their task is to uh, go outside and gather um, a pile of similar leaves from the same kind of tree and bring it, bring it inside, bring that pile inside and choose one to draw. And I say, you have to, you have to take at least a half an hour. Um, observing this leaf and, and drawing it. Um, so seeing um, the, the act of drawing is a wonderful way to learn to see. It, it brings you back and back and back, in this case to the leaf, to see things that you hadn't noticed before. And of course, students are very quick to draw the parallel between what it means to see a leaf and what it means to see their students. Um, but it's, um, it's a wonderful uh, activity because it's, it, it's beautiful. Um, and I gather their pictures and I make a, an album, a leaf album out of their collected pictures um, along with a, a Robert Frost poem that talks about the, um, the fleetingness of, of the beauty of fall and <clears throat> in this part of the world. Um, but it's something that belongs to the group this, this leaf album. Okay, so then getting more complex, um, I moved to a poem and Denise, you'll recognize this poem. Um, it's called Miss Rosie by Lucille Clif Clifton. And I'll just read it because it's not very long. Uh, when I watch you wrapped up like garbage, sitting surrounded by the smell of two old potato peels, or when I watch you in your old man's shoes with a little toe cut out, sitting waiting for your mind like next week's grocery. I say when I watch you, you wet brown bag of a woman who used to be the best looking gal in Georgia, used to be called the Georgia Rose. I stand up, I stand up through your destruction, I stand up. Um, and when I introduce the poem, students, always say I hate poetry um, because I think they've been made to analyze poems right from the get-go instead of just seeing what's in the poem. So in this poem, there are, there are images and I have students also draw the poem to draw what they see. And incredibly, their drawings are really, really different. They see different things, um, and they have to um, they have to read this poem um, with somebody else, at least one other person. Sometimes they do it with their students. Sometimes they do it with family members. Um, it doesn't matter whom they do it with, but it has to be more than just them. And they have to start with just describing what's in the poem. What do you notice? What do you notice about the images? What do you notice about the language? What do you notice about the structure? And then inevitably, um, what comes out of that discussion is meaning. It's, it's as though you know each drop of description in the bucket um, finally gets to a point where it overflows the bucket and you've got meaning. People are talking meaning. 
Um, so that's the poem. And then we go to, so, so up to this point, we've had these lovely exercises that um, are fun and beautiful. Uh, and then I bring in a drawing. Um, it's this drawing here that you can see a bit of, um, which I call the gun and the naked woman. And what you can't see is that there's um, a woman here leaning against a brick wall uh, who's naked and then this sort of smoke going out of the gun. And the student's assignment um, is the same as with the poem and the leaf. It's just to describe what they see without making judgments, but also later to describe the judgments that they found themselves making as they looked, making about the student who did the drawing um, when they looked at it. So, what they find themselves in the midst of, the, the experience that they have is that they are dying to jump to conclusions about this student, who, the student who did the, the drawing. Um, and so they have that as another piece of information about themselves. Um, and it's only when they've completed this description of student work um, that I revealed to them, which is maybe a little bit tricky and a little bit mean, is I revealed to them that my son did the drawing. Um, he grew up in rural Vermont in the woods. Um, he is a lovely human being. He's, he's an outdoor educator now. He drew this when he was 16. And I have a statement from him. And they, so they come up against their assumptions that the, the artist must be troubled, the artist must come from a violent background, um, and their propensity to, to miss the skill and you know, the, what the artist was bringing to this, um, to miss that in favor of their conclusions about who the, who the learner must be without stopping to find out and stopping to see the strengths that are there. So the next exercise we do is um, something I call the teaching game where um, my students have to teach something to either to the students that they have or to a, uh, you know, a group of friends or family members, just a 20 minute lesson in anything. Um, it could be in the subject that they teach or it could be like how to make an origami figure. It doesn't matter, they choose. But the, the thing is that they then have to, um, at the end of the exercise, get feedback from the learners and not give feedback, but get feedback from the learners about their experiences as learners. And um, my, my goal is to, um, to have them lift up the, the hood of the car, the bonnet of the car, and get a look inside and to share with students that, you know, I can see what you do. I can see the learning um, that you demonstrate in class by giving you certain things to do, but I can't necessarily see inside your head or your heart. I don't know how you're feeling exactly. I can guess, but I want to hear from you exactly what that experience was like. And also I wanna hear from you about where you'd like to go next in your learning because um, students are incredible partners in figuring out how to make a class better. And I wanna give my students the experience of what that's like. And they, they, they get it because they give me feedback about the course, so they get it at that level. But then I ask them to do that with their students as well. And then, as I've said before, the final activity is a descriptive review of a learner, which they've been doing through the whole semester where they're describing a human being. Um, and that is a very complex enterprise um, as they learn. So that's the structure of those experiences. So then I wanna talk about um, some of the texts not the readings, which I, I have wonderful readings, uh, I think, um, but some of the other texts that I've really integrated lately as 
podcasts and films have proliferated and uh, resources are, are much more available than they were even a year ago. So um, I look upon these texts, podcasts, documentaries, short stories, and published personal accounts as vicarious experiences. So they're sort of additional, not grounding experiences, but more um, expanding upon the experiences that they've had to vicariously experience what other people have gone through. And these are some of the texts that I use. 1619 is a podcast which traces the history of slavery in the US from the year 1619 when the first slave boat came over from Africa. Um, Precious Knowledge, which is um, the story of an indigenous uh, learning uh, class in Arizona um, that is uh, uh, sabotaged by um, white members of the community as seditious, um, but which is incredibly important to the students who were in it. So there's that story. This um, Nice White Parents, is a podcast out of the New York Times, which talks about the power that white parents have in schools, even, even schools that they have sent their, their children to um, with majority minority populations to give their children um, the experience of being in an integrated school. But in the, pat, the power they have as white parents sort of takes over. So it's a, it's a five part, um, podcast about how that happens and how persistent that pattern is. Um, the Power of an Illusion is, is sort of a three-part, um, three-hour uh, video of um, what race is and isn't. Um, and then some of the, the, policy, the US policies um, around race uh, and yeah. So that's another, part of the course and then and then this um podcast this american life which is um not sure if you can get it in south africa but um entitled the problem we all live with which is a story about the integration of uh, a school in st louis missouri where um michael brown was was shot and killed by the police and just gives you a um an insight into the school system of uh an all-black neighborhood and then all, that had to integrate with an all white neighborhood. So these issues of race are threaded throughout the course. Um, and it's a challenge for my students, mostly upstate New York white students um, to figure out how they, um, how these uh, document, these texts uh, relate to their classrooms. But it's, um, I've got students who really wanna work on it and they kind of lift um, all other boats with them. Okay. So I wanna go now to the integrative lecture um, and what that consists of. So uh, as I said, um, let me just go back a sec. As I said, students post their responses um, to the readings, to the documentaries, to their experiences in discussion groups, I go through and read them. And as I read them, I copy and paste quotes um, from the students' own posts. Um, and then I integrate those into my own lecture, um, which brings out some of the main points of, of the readings and, and the themes of the module. Um, and I'll give you an example of what one of those is. So we've been, we read um, Bev Tatum's book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? And I just note, I'm talking about the reading. Tatum goes on to say that a system of advantage based on race works in similar ways to a system of advantage based on gender or ableism. The advantages are built into our institutions. As Tatum says, it's in the very air we breathe. This idea is a hard one to internalize and I don't expect you to read it and go, oh yeah, of course. It calls up so much around our own sense of ourselves as good and decent people, which we are. 
as we read and listen to more pieces over the semester, I hope to complicate what good and decent means in this country and in its institutions. Many of you offered examples that already begin to do this. So I put forth sort of what I think Tatum is trying to say and then draw upon a student's post. So Kaylee tells the story of her hometown up in the Finger Lakes that celebrated only Christmas. When she moved to the Hudson Valley, she was amazed at the diversity of religious practices there. For the first time, she noticed how many were left out by a purely Christian perspective. That people were not being represented wasn't apparent to me because I already, I was already represented by my home school district, writes Kaylee. I never meant to be prejudiced and not acknowledge other religious holidays. It was just all I knew and was taught. If I never moved to the Hudson Valley, and I, I may never have come to this understanding and been made aware of misinformation. So I could have left the lecture at this, but bringing Kaylee's story into it as an example, and then having Kaylee, uh, and I know this because of feedback, um, having for Kaylee, it's a moment of feeling seen that her story is something that I've attended to um, and valued. And students um, again and again tell me that these lectures um, really matter to them. A, because it helps them make sense of the content, but B, because they feel seen. Um, and, you know, Frary talks to speaking with and, and to students. So pulling back um, away from the course now, uh, the structure that I use beginning with this bottom bubble is beginning with experience, with interaction, giving structuring some kind of experience for students where they interact directly with the world. Then having them reflect on that experience. In other words, to story or narrate that experience so that they take a bit of a step back from from how, from, from being in it, they take a step back to relate to it. And then I take what they have stated and I restory it, contextualizing all of their experiences together uh, in the larger themes of the course. And then hopefully by then I will have done, you know, made a, a small dent in their capacity for, for critical perception and um, hopefully their motivation to take action in the world. And I see this cycle as um, a, more of a spiral rather than linear. So this image of a Nautilus is for me an image of learning. Um, and it echoes Dewey's quote, education is that reconstruction and reorganization of experience which is the storying that adds meaning to experience and increases ability to direct the course of subsequent experience. And I will end with a quote from Freire, uh, to exist humanly is to name the world, to change it. Once named the world in its turn reappears to the namers as a problem and requires of them a new naming. Human beings are not built in silence, but in word, in work, in action reflection. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Rogers. Um, we move over to Dr. Satora for the response. Um, thanks, Mukhtar. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, I trust that you are well and that you're keeping safe um, during this very challenging times that we find ourselves in. Um, thank you, Mukhtar and the Humanizing Pedagogy Project um, com uh, Committee for setting up this wonderful webinar series and for giving me the opportunity to engage and respond uh, to Prof. Rogers' uh, interesting uh, presentation. Um, thanks, Prof. Rogers, uh, for your thought-provoking presentation. It provided a lot of food for thought as we plan 
back here in South Africa um, to start the 2021 academic year under these very difficult and trying conditions that we find ourselves. I met uh, Prof. Rogers about 10 years ago when I was still a very new, when I was still very new in the Faculty of Education. And she uh, was a research fellow um, back then. I will always fondly remember her as being one of the two ladies who introduced me to humanizing pedagogy. The other, obviously, being Prof. Denise. And I remember all our meetings to develop a clear understanding of the concepts teaching, learning, research, and engagement, and how this led to the development of guiding principles that would underpin our curriculum renewal journey and what a journey it ended up being, eventually culminating in, a, uh, in us developing a humanizing curriculum framework that highlight the, highlighted the following critical questions that would guide us in developing our modules and the learning material for these modules. These questions, and, and you will probably um, remember them, um, Prof. Rogers, is the question of who, who is our students and who are we as teacher educators? What, what is the knowledge and experiences um, that they bring into the classroom. How, how do they learn best? Where, where do they learn best and how do we create an environment conducive to learning? And how do we know? How do we ensure that learning is actually taking place? So how do we assess fairly? Reflecting on these questions allowed us to truly see our students and see ourselves as teacher educators. Um, I remember the story of Sipukazi, uh, Prof Zin, that allowed us to see who the student is that sits in our class. And that, that story allowed us to create a curriculum and modules for the student that actually sits in our class. Our curriculum renewal journey con uh, continues on in the faculty today, as we currently in the third year of rolling out the new curriculum and we are writing up the fourth year um, B Ed program modules. The curriculum renewal process initiated various research projects, including the research for my own PhD. The curriculum journey was not easy and often left us asking more questions than having answers. Central in our curriculum framework is what Prof. Rogers started out with, and it started with those um, meetings of understanding the concepts of teaching, learning, and um, engagement and research, is, is Hawkins's learning triangle. Um, that highlights the relationship between the teacher, the student, and the content. What I found in my research is that traditionally we place too much emphasis on the content and we forget about the importance of establishing a humanizing trust relationship between the teacher and the student that is also required for learning to take place. We forget just to see the student for who the student are for the students of. Um, that is also required for learning to take place. We need to understand who that student um, is that's sitting in our class. Um, so instead we focus on what it is we need to teach them to meet policy requirements rather than looking at who the student actually is. Um, my research also highlighted that there are various reasons for this, including that teachers do not know how to develop a humanizing relationship with their students. Teachers claim that there is a lack of examples on how they can do this. Furthermore, teachers struggle to see their students as equal partners in, in the learning process, probably because of the way they were schooled, where the teacher was the sole source of um, knowledge they also say learners do not know what they need to learn. 
reinforcing the idea that teachers know what a learner needs to learn. They also indicated that the process is time consuming as you have to look for appropriate learning material, struggle to get students to engage with the material and then draw on what comes from, from the engagement to teach the topic. Thus, most of them fall back on set curriculums and prescribed textbooks. However, the advantages of applying a humanizing pedagogy approach, as we saw this afternoon, far outweighs the concerns mentioned above. And this afternoon's presentation is a good example of how the use of story and the drawing on or creating an experience can be used to create a humanizing learning experience. The use of story and experience is underpinned by the three educational aims of critical pedagogy as highlighted by Frey. They are the, the, these are the importance of humanization through dialogue, critical conscientization and problematizing education. Dialogue according to Frey is an existential necessity for humanizing people and can only occur under conditions of profound love for the world and human beings. Dialogue is a process of knowing and learning which um, encourages students to get to know themselves, others and the world they live in. And we saw this in, in Prof Rogers' um, example that she shared with us. So this is a way for students to engage in their own learning as the practice of dialogue enhances student participation and limits teacher transmission. It, allow, it allows for the tapping into silent voices and establishing why these voices are silent. Frey suggests that only dialogue which requires critical thinking is capable of generating critical action. Without dialogue, there is no communication and without communication, there can be no education, no true education. The use of themes in the dialogue helps to enhance the process as we saw in Prof Rogers' example. Boyce in her research highlights that a, te that a teaching theme should emerge from the real lives of students. This theme um, is relevant and should be relevant to a, a particular group of students that you teach. Um, to provide them an opportunity for dialoguing and allowing um, learning that has meaning and relevance to take place. With such a, a, a theme, and we saw some of the themes that, that uh, Prof. Rogers highlighted, the issue of race. Um, with such a theme, the teacher conceptualizes the introductory um, dialogue and engages students through relevant text, pictures, video clips, and readings. We saw the, the drawing of the leaf, the using of the poem, um, taking into account various viewpoints and subsequently facilitating various writing and speaking tasks as students work through the themes. We thus have to ask ourselves, how do we employ dialogue in our modules? We were given the example of story and experience. So how do, how do we use story and experience in our modules to elicit dialogue? I can tell you um, that this sounds daunting. I found it daunting, especially, you know, for, uh, for me coming from a, co a commercial background. I thought that I was not um, creative, you know, that I wouldn't be able to use poems. But lo and behold, you know, I tried. Um, I was somehow pushed to try. And, and when I tried, um, I realized that this, this definitely works. Um, so now I start every module of mine asking students to reflect and share positive learning experience. And this leads me um, to talking about characteristics of a good teacher, drawing on what students describe in their reflection of a learning experience. I often use poetry now to encourage, and, and Prof Rogers, I'm going to use the leave example now as well. Um, so uh, thanks for sharing that with us. Um, in the presentation, we saw how using story and experience, whether it was through podcasts, a poem, drawing a leave, um, you know, using a film, created critical consciousness. 
from a critical perspective, conscientization is one of the most important characteristics and authentic learning um, then takes place through this conscientization. Freire defines conscientization as follows, to learn to perceive social, political, economic contradictions and to take action against the oppressive um, elements of reality. The process of conscientization occurs when students and their teachers know that they know and they know that they need to act upon this knowing. Ira Shaw identifies four qualities of critical consciousness um, that enhances problem solving. He uh, names them as power awareness, critical literacy, permanent desocialization, and self education, and explicate that these qualities create a love for social justice. And I'm left asking is this not what we want for our students? We want them to be conscious of the context that impact the learning of their learners. And we want them to act upon it to bring about the required change. So how do we enhance the critical consciousness of our students? Using story and experience in teaching embraces the notion of problem posing, which is the third educational aim of uh, critical pedagogy. It opposes the banking system of education that Freire describes as a system um, where teachers teach and students are taught. Teachers know everything and the students know nothing. Teachers think and the students are, uh, are thought about. And so we can go on. We know that explanation of, of, of free. Instead, problem posing education acknowledges real life problems experienced by students and draw on lived experience to collectively develop a response to these problems. And you see that in, in, in uh, Prof Rogers' um, uh, module where she draws on uh, or creates experiences by asking students to listen to podcasts um, on issues of race. Um, so bringing in real life uh, experiences, um, the example of living with um, the problem that, that we all know about. Um, so the collective nature of the process is also highlighted in Prof Rogers' presentation. I picked up on that. Um, the collective um, nature of the process um, is, is, is important. Um, as much as uh, individual reflection is required, learning is also dependent on interaction with peers and the teacher. Problem posing depends on a dialogical connection between knowledge and praxis, as well as the revised relationship between teacher and the student. In this model, the teachers and students are equal partners in the classroom and they learn from each other. And we heard from Prof Rogers how she does this. It is not easy as the teacher must make themselves vulnerable. And it is difficult to relinquish control as we heard when she explained the grounding experience of descriptive feedback. We, we thinking feedback is we giving feedback as teachers to the students, but the feedback was actually the students giving feedback on what they learned. And that as teachers, we have to make ourselves vulnerable to hear how the students experienced the process. Um, in this response, I tried to highlight uh, that the three educational aims of critical pedagogy, namely through dialogue, conscientization and problem posing education are closely linked and enhances humanization. In Prof Rogers' presentation, we see how using story and experience embraces these three aims um, and how these aims work collectively to encourage teachers and students to, to question their current situation and the content that they have to cover and subsequently take action to improve their situation um, so as to contribute to the required change. As I conclude, I'm mindful that we are preparing for the 2021 academic year. And with the current COVID-19 lockdown, three restrictions in place in South Africa, we will probably be confined to online teaching in the first semester. So how do we do, how do we apply a humanizing approach during online teaching? We, we saw an example, we heard and saw the example from Prof um, Rogers uh, this afternoon. Um, but drawing on, on, on what Prof Rogers said in her own, um, in the blog and in the presentation, I'm using some of her words to conclude. 
I have found that when students are completely disembodied, only Blackboard posts, that it can be a dehumanizing experience for them. Delayed responses from peers and from me, the inability to put a face or personality to a name, the lack of spontaneity, um, all chip away at what makes us human. When I read this in Prof's blog, I just thought of my own students, of our students that come from areas with limited resources, where the concept of learning was embodied in the teacher. Those grade 12s, they only thought of learning as the teacher that taught them. Just imagine the challenges, the dehumanization, if they cannot see in the flesh or speak to a lecturer in person. All the adjustments that they will have to make as we, the university, assume that all students enter the institution with the skills required to navigate the system. We will have to think about this carefully and get our staff to think about this too. And we have to ask, how do we make ourselves more accessible to our students to support their learning? Also, what kind of support mechanisms do we put in place, not just in the institution or the faculty, but in our own modules? We will have to look at what Prof Rogers uh, suggested regarding finding a balance between using MS Teams, that's um, um, what we use in, term, uh, in place of Zoom, and then um, using Moodle for our activities. So finding a balance between how we use that. Despite the concept um, that Prof used, container, um, because it sounds very restrictive like a black box, the, 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 the structure is still very, very important. So we need to have structure um, for what we're going to be doing and how we're going to present it and what we're going to be presenting to our students. We need to have guiding principles. We need to select appropriate grounding experiences and we need to make ourselves vulnerable and see our students as partners in the learning process. We need to live the change we want to see. Thank you, colleagues, and everything of the best for 2021's academic year. Thank you so much, Dr. Satora. Wow, um, I'm lost for words. A powerful presentation, uh, a moving response. Thank you so much to Prof. Rogers and Dr. Satora for an excellent presentation and response today. Colleagues, we have about 15 minutes left. So I'm going to go directly to the comments that we have in the chat, as well as uh, three questions. Um, comments from Nokanyo. Thank you, Carol, for providing an example of humanizing pedagogy in teaching and learning. This makes a lot of sense to me. Um, a comment from Carolyn, inspiring presentation, Prof Rogers, thank you. Another comment from Carmel. Thank you, Carol, for your focus on compassion and empathy particularly at a time when the COVID pandemic impacts negatively on the mental uh, well-being of teachers and learners. And uh, the first comment and question here from Margie Childs. Hello, Carol. Do you have a sense of how one could use the approach you have outlined with large groups, for example, 150 plus students? The rich and varied stories students bring are important funds of knowledge and insight. And then I'll add the second question as well from Pumeza. Thank you for sharing. Uh, thank you for such rich sharing. I'm wondering how you contain or manage the emotions that would flow out of the shared experiences. Okay, I'm I'm on, right? You are on, yes, definitely. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, I first want to thank Halloween for an amazing response. Um, I feel seen. And I feel as though you, I, I came with the story of my experience of the course, and you took it up to the levels of recontextualizing it in terms of, of theory, um, Freire's theory in particular, and elevated it uh, in a way that was just beautiful. Thank you, Heloise. Um, and then hello to Marky and Comeza and Norcano. Um, the, the question about large groups I've been thinking about a lot. I, the largest group I have is 30, which is not 150. But I think in my experience in teaching, 
you can always reduce the size of a large group by working with small groups, by charging small groups with the tasks that I might usually do. So um, with the learning stories, for example, to have them share their learning stories in those small groups and then perhaps write a summary of what was learned from that and then drawing from that. Um, you know, 150 leaves can be a lot to, to, to put into an album, but you can have small groups make their own albums and make those available to, to students. I think it's, it, it's mostly a logistical um, solution. Um, do what you usually do with a group of, of 25 and make them do the work. Um, I think they're capable of doing it. And, and also the other thing I would do, Margie, is to ask them what would work for them um, because they will have, they'll have good ideas about how to go about working with large groups. Um, and Mukta, could you remind me of Kameza's uh, comment, question? Uh, Kameza uh, shared, thank you for such rich sharing. I'm wondering how you contain or manage the emotions that flow yeah. out of the shared experiences. Yeah. Um, I just embrace them, I guess. Um, I acknowledge them. I, I talk about how, what it evoked in me. Um, I try to contextualize those emotions uh, in if there are larger themes around them that might help to explain the source of those emotions. Um, and I guess I return to Freire's quote that I used at the end that um, naming the world is, is a way of holding what can feel overwhelming um, instead of being subject to it, to hold it as object and to find a place for that in the larger ideas that I as the professor bring to the course that they don't necessarily have. That makes sense. Thanks, Prof. Um, I'm going to move to a comment and question uh, from Zarina, and then we'll take um, uh, some input from Seneta. Um, from Zarina, good afternoon. Thank you for the valuable concrete examples to facilitate experience in story-based learning and teaching. You emphasized academics seeing students and hearing their stories, acknowledging their experiences. The other side of that is that academics being seen as fully human. How can we create opportunities for academics to reveal their stories, realities, experiences to students in the LT context to enable authentic relationships between the teacher and student? Mm. So I hear that question on, on two levels. Um, one, how can I make in, in that container of teaching and learning, um, how can I humanize myself in that exchange? Um, and I think that, you know, as Heloise said so beautifully, when there's dialogue, that is humanizing. And I can offer my stories in conjunction with hearing their stories. Uh, and I do often do that. Um, it helps that I've been teaching for more than 40 years and have lots of those experiences to draw upon. Um, but students love to hear them. Um, and so that's one way I think of humanizing uh, the teacher within the container. The other is to, to construct containers of uh, mutual vulnerability and learning with one's peers outside of the classroom. And I will say that in, in my own career, I have started many groups um, because I need that community to, um, to share my experiences as a teacher and a teacher educator with. And we use um, you know, a structure for reflection that is very similar to what I just described to you, starting with our experience and then pulling back um, to see, we, harvest themes, which is something, um, it's a phrase that, that I, I first used in South Africa when we heard the humanized stories of humanizing and dehumanizing. But 
to have a small group of colleagues that um, uses the same process that we're having students use, that I'm having students use, uh, is for me, you know, students come and go. My colleagues are my more um, permanent group. And uh, I have one group that I've been doing this with for more than 30 years. And the group has shifted over time, but that group, in fact, we just finished writing a paper about the process. Um, that group is central to our emotional and mental health. Thanks, Prof. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to ask Sunita to uh, participate. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to all of you for this opportunity and for creating this platform for us. Um, I have one question that I would like to know more about. I don't know if I'm being ignorant or if I'm just missing the point, but I want to know how do you balance humanizing pedagogy and classroom management um, as well as discipline and respect in terms of a school setup? Um, towards the educator or especially when the educator um, tries to be inclusive and the learners require structure. Thank you, Sunita. So I hear two, two words that um, I'll respond to. One is the notion of balance. Um, I don't see them as two things that need to be balanced, humanizing pedagogy on one hand and management on the other. I think they're, um, uh, part and parcel of the same thing. It has to do with relationship. I think it's very hard to manage a classroom where there is no relationship. So, I mean, one thing I say to my students when they're first starting to teach is that every, I say, take at least the first week in your classroom just to form community. Forget about the content. Just have students get to know each other and get to know you and, and you them. Um, establish norms that are co-created um, by the group, not imposed by the teacher. Doesn't mean the teacher doesn't have a say. Um, the teacher knows what makes the classroom work and can inter interject as another member of that community what she thinks um, uh, is necessary. Um, the other is uh, structure, um, that I think structure is essential. And I don't think a humanizing pedagogy should imply in any way a lack of structure um, or of, of free flowing. I mean, that lear learning is emergent is structured into the class. There's, you know, I have created very, um, you know, Heloise talked about the container feeling confining. Well, it is in a lot of ways, very confining. It's a very strict structure um, for how each module goes and what each activity is and when it's due and, you know, how long it should be and so forth. Um, so there are ways of being uh, that I require and, but, but that also they have a say in um, through feedback. Uh, so <clears throat> I don't see them as, as uh, opposed. I see them as totally integrated and, and codependent. Okay, thank you very much. Sure, pleasure. Thanks, Sunita. Thanks, Prof. Um, I'm going to take the question from uh, Denise, and I think you touched on this a bit uh, now, uh, Prof. Uh, can Carol say more about the concept of container? as this often evokes a negative response because of the connotation of constraint. Yeah. Yeah, so I, um, I would repeat what I just said, um, that I think we all know that children and adults are no different, respond to um, positively to structure. Um, and I see a container as um, something that offers safety, uh, a predictable 
uh, reliable set of boundaries that while um, unlike a bottle, which has to be broken, um, the kind of structure that I'm talking about is flexible. Um, it's always open to critique and it's always op on, on a you know, module by module basis and even within the module um, to being adjusted. And I have, I mean, I, the, the container as I describe it has changed. I mean, it's different this year than it was last year. I've added things in like, I, I didn't used to do Zoom, um, Zoom meetings with students partly because Zoom didn't exist, but um, since it's become available Students have requested it. Another thing that I've done is um, integrated much more visual stuff because students are, are more, um, they've requested more uh, audio visual input from me and not just reading text. So, so the container is, is solid, but organic, I guess is my way of answering that. Thanks, thanks, Prof. We have a final comment and question. Uh, thank you, Prof. Rogers and Satora for this presentation and information. Um, this comes from here, the cousins. I couldn't help wonder how to decrease the gap between teacher and learner in accounting disciplines, where there is a huge gap between the two groups, especially since the teaching is so focused on content and possibly rightly so, given the nature of the discipline that is so strongly tied to legislation. Wow. I know nothing about accounting, but um, I would guess, I mean, it has to do with money and um, money is such a huge part of all of our lives. I would, if I were, teaching accounting for the first time, I guess I would ask myself, you know, what are the ways in which my students encounter accounting um, in their daily life? How can I then extract that and relate it to the principles that I'm teaching um, in a way that, that brings them in as having experienced those principles themselves? Um, not sure, not sure, um, not knowing the content, what that would be, but, but that's how I would start. Thanks, Prof. There's a comment uh, by Denise and Carol, this reminds me of the statement, the beauty of the pictures in the frame. <laughs> uh, forget right now who the author is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, those boundaries, um, I don't know, Denise, if you're talking now about my your 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 question um, about the container or the question around accounting, but um, I would agree that the how you contain the main event <laughs> really matters. I'm not sure if Denise wants to take uh, thirty seconds to say something. <laughs> Okay. Um, all right, uh, Prof. Carol Rogers, Dr. Heloise Satora. Okay, these Denise and Prof. Denise. And. Yeah. You may unmute, uh, Prof. I, I don't actually. Yes, I was talking about the container, and I'm just trying to remember who that is because it's something that. One has to think about quite deeply, you know, that the beauty of the picture is in the frame. So it's not the frame necessarily that's beautiful, it's the fact that it allows one to focus and keep within, uh, keep that focus and notice it. So that's what I was referring to. But I want to take this opportunity to say that Eloise is an accounting teacher and she could perhaps respond to the question about accounting and humanization. She's really good at Hello, Elise, would you like to respond?
Okay. Me. <laughs> yes, I could. <laughs> no, I couldn't. I couldn't unmute myself, uh, Mukhtar. You had me muted there. <laughs> Um, yes, it is. It's a, it's a very, very good question. Um, and from my, my own experience as an accounting teacher, um, you know, it was, it, was, it was very difficult for me to make that uh, change. Um, it's a mind shift that is required because we focus so much on, um, you know, um, money is so important. So, uh, you know, what we teach about accounting is important. So the content is going to be important. Um, but it's how the student learn. Um, and, you know, um, if we're going to stick to that textbook and the examples that they give in the textbook, um, the student will complete the course with us um, and forget what, what they learned in that course. It's about how we make that learning meaningful um, you know, and if I think back of where I was 10 years ago and how I'm currently teaching um, accounting, it's totally, totally different. You know, as I mentioned, I start off um, and I agree with, with, with Carol about this. I take that first um, week or two just to get to know the students that's there, uh, because then you know uh, who you're working with. And, um, you know, you... And even with each of the topics that I teach, I first establish what they know about that topic already, um, you know, because then I can draw on that to teach the topic. And I fill in um, the, the gaps that they don't know on that particular topic. That makes it more meaningful for them going, going off. Um, you know, my colleagues uh, in the house will know that I've, I've, I've said this to them as well. Uh, even in terms of assessment, I nowadays, you know, um, I have um, my, my, my schedule, my, my structure, my study letter for, for, for the um, course, and I have topics there. But I also ask students, you know, whether there's topics that they would like um, us to sort of look at, and I add that into it. And even with, with, with assessment, you know, get their voice into it because this is how they then feel that it's their learning. They're taking ownership of their learning. Um, and, uh, you know, I can go on and give you several practical examples, uh, the, the person who asked the question, but I'm going to leave it at that. Thanks, thanks, Mukhtar, because I know we've got, um, you know, a set time to deal with this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, colleagues. Um... Uh, Dr. Heloise Satora, uh, Prof. Carol Rogers, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a really rich uh, discussion today. Uh, thank you so much to all the attendees as well for uh, the comments and the questions. And I'd like to remind everyone of uh, our next webinar on Tuesday with Professor Nukanyo Mzanga and Dr. Mukim Wing. Uh, please uh, RSVP on the website. Colleagues, thank you so much again. Have a wonderful day further. It's the start of the day for Carol and our day is ending here in South Africa. <laughs> Can I say one thing before I leave? Yes, please, please Carol. I just wanted to say that um, this, for me, this is a course, a single course that I teach. Um, and it doesn't sit within a humanizing institution. And it's therefore limited. I think I make a difference to a certain degree, but, um, it's not reinforced by the institution and it's not reinforced necessarily by the institutions that my students work in. I think you are so fortunate to have an institution that embraces these principles and has tried to um, infuse them across the university and has taken so much time. And I mean, I was in, at a relative beginning stage of your process. Uh, and I know um, what Derek Schwartz and Denise brought to this work and also Ilsa, um, and the tremendous amount of work that's happened over the last 10 years. And think it's amazing that anybody who chooses to teach a course in a way that is humanizing is reinforced by the institution that you're embedded in. And, I think it's very special and, and 
quite wonderful and um, would thank all of the people that, that um, built it <laughs> um, for you and am grateful for that and to have been a part of that. So. Thank you so much, Carol. That's a good reality check for many of us uh, employed or working or lecturing, teaching at Nelson Mandela. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Heloise. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> we uh, have to continue so the much. process, Mukhtar. <laughs> no, we, we, we have to, yes, without a doubt. Colleagues, thank mm -hmm. you so much. And uh, to the attendees for staying the extra uh, six minutes, thank you so much for your patience. Uh, and I look forward to seeing everyone on Tuesday next week. To take care, stay safe, and until we see each other next week. Bye-bye. Thank you.